as we're reading through Hebrews. The writer is saying, look, I want you to think about Jesus and the supremacy of Jesus and the fact that he is our great hero, the one we want to emulate in so many things. Don't let this matter fade from your consciousness. Know how important this is. And in order to make the case, he's going to make the case that Jesus is even greater than the great Moses was. Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfelt. Welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. I'm delighted to have you join me today. I'm talking about having a hero and, um, and talking about Jesus as our hero. And I know that sounds very interesting and maybe even very, you know, put offing. And uh, however that sounds to you, go with me on this for just a moment. Every people group in history, every country, every culture, every race of humanity cherishes their heroes. Uh, we know they do. I mean, many countries put their heroes on their, on their money. Um, they make statues of them. They have, you know, paintings of them, all sorts of things. And of course, um, they teach about their heroes to the schools, to the school kids. And so it's important to remember them because heroes inspire, but they're also supposed to call the next generation forward to greatness. I mean, that's the advantage of making sure that, you know, kids growing up have heroes. Um, you know, the nature of the hero that a culture celebrates tells us a great deal about what that culture is or who they are. You know, years ago, um, Henry Kissinger, and if you don't know who he is, um, a man was quite famous in his day. Um, he said, and I quote, Our age finds it difficult to come to grips with figures like Winston Churchill. The political leaders with whom we're familiar generally aspire to be superstars, he said, rather than heroes. And that's an interesting quote in and of itself because here's what he said about superstars. Superstars, he said, crave consensus. That is, they want to bring as many people on board as they can. They're looking for popularity. The greater their popularity is, the greater their success is. That's how a superstar thinks. But heroes, said Kissinger, define themselves by their judgment of a future they can see and their leadership to bring about that future. That means that, you know, that, that a true hero is really only judged by history because you look at the vision that they had and they went for that vision because they believed it was the right one and they called individuals to follow it. And now that we have the, you know, the, the lens of history to look at them, we say, oh yeah, they really did lead us to a better place. And that's why Kissinger thought that our age found it very difficult to deal with people like Winston Churchill, who wasn't interested in popularity at all, but was interested in doing the right thing. You know, I, I think that heroes are people who are really not afraid to be unpopular because it's not popularity or the adulation of the crowds that they're interested in. Now, I, I do think Kissinger is onto something here. I mean, superstars, I would argue, even in the church, have been, uh, you know, they've replaced the heroes that we've had uh, among us. And, you know, in our day, we look at how popular is a pastor, but we're also looking at not only how popular they are, but who are the other superstars in our culture? I mean, be they, you know, media superstars or sporting stars or, you know, in some other line of work in which everyone kind of adores that people. If those people also become a part of that church and a part of that pastor, we say, wow, that guy's really got something going because we worship the kind of a superstar pastor but a hero is different. Let me give you some of the Christian heroes in the past. I mentioned, first of all, the name Athanasius. Athanasius fought this tireless battle for the full humanity and full deity of Christ and suffered greatly for it. He took upon himself a much, you know, an opponent who was much more popular than he, a man by the name of Arius, and he managed to win that battle. I mean, we look at him as one of the great heroes of the faith. I mean, I would encourage, especially young people, to have a full list of Christian heroes. You know, Hudson Taylor bringing the gospel to China. I mean, Gladys always. I mean, I'm thinking of a number of different people whom I would argue are heroes, not because they were popular in their time, but because they had a vision that they pursued and it was the right one and eventually led the church, the people of God, to see something about what God has called us to do. We don't need superstars at all. 
but we do need heroes. Now, we've come to Hebrews chapter three, and in Hebrews chapter three, we come to a chapter in which we're told to consider the faithfulness of Jesus. Now, Jesus is, of course, our great hero. In other words, he walked a pathway in which he's called us to follow, if you, you, know, if you agree with my definition of a true hero. And he is one of the great examples of faithfulness in the Bible. And what we're gonna find in the text that we'll read, there's gonna be a, a contrast between Jesus and Moses, and we're gonna read about that. Now, the reason why Moses comes up often in the book of Hebrews is because, as you know, the book is written to Jewish Christians, and you know one of the great heroes of the faith for all Jews was Moses. I mean, Moses held a place unlike anyone else, and so therefore, to use this as an example is very important in this. I mean, you think about why Moses is a hero. First of all, Moses stood up against Pharaoh. Uh, you know, Moses also stood up against the sons of Korah, who were rebelled, I mean, they were rebels with among the Jewish people. Um, Moses wrote scripture. Moses gave the law. Moses oversaw worship. I mean, Moses forged a nation. I mean, there is a reason to call this man a hero. And so, therefore, to say that, you know, let's compare Jesus and Moses, that would have really touched the ears of the Hebrew Christians. So I'm reading now from Hebrews chapter three, one to six. If you have your Bible with you, please follow along because uh, you know we're gonna read this together. This is the word of God. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to, who, to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and are boasting in our hope. Now, uh, you know, as you begin to read this, you can really get the sense of the relationship that the writer of Hebrews has with the people who are receiving this letter. Um, you remember I said it really is a sermon, but the sermon is written down and it's now mailed out uh, to people who really should read a sermon that was preached. And notice that our text here begins by calling the readers. First of all, it, notice it says, calls them holy brothers. And then the author says, who share in the heavenly calling. So it's quite clear. You know, the author is writing to people whom he considers to be faithful in Christ. And yet this is a track to say, don't stop being faithful. You know, if I can give you an example of what's going on here, I would think a good example would be, I don't know if you've ever been to a rally, but if you have, I want you to imagine a speaker at a rally. People gather together for a cause, maybe on an outdoor event. I don't know what the cause is. I remember um, some time ago, I was in Sri Lanka, and I was taken to a place that, you know, cared for turtles. And uh, turtles in the ocean uh, often will eat um, plastic because they think the plastic is either a jellyfish or something like that. And so they eat it. And because they digest it into their system, I mean, it completely either kills them or as I saw one very large, beautiful turtle, I mean, it basically made that turtle buoyant like a cork and it could no longer submerse underneath you know, the water, and, and, I, and I saw the plight of these gorgeous animals that God has made. So I want you to imagine you're going to a, um, to a rally, you know, against, you know, throwing away plastic into our oceans and destroying marine life, some of these beautiful creatures that God has made. So imagine the speaker speaking with great passion about this matter. Well, you know that he's not trying to convince the crowd. They're there because they're already convinced, but what the speaker is really trying to do to the crowd is saying, look, resolve this. Don't let this issue fade. Make sure you continue to bring it forward. And that kind of an idea is what we find here uh, as we're reading through Hebrews. The writer is saying, look, I want you to think about Jesus and the supremacy of Jesus and the fact that he is our great hero, the one we want to emulate in so many things, don't let this matter fade from your consciousness. Know how important this is. And in order to make the case, 
he's going to make the case that Jesus is even greater than the great Moses was. Now notice when he starts talking about Jesus right here at the beginning, he calls him the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Well, I've talked about high priest in the last you know, address that I had with you. And if you want to know more about that, you go back to that. But he also calls Jesus an apostle here. And as far as I know, this is the only place in the entire Bible where Jesus is called our apostle. Now, you know, the word apostle means that apostle is someone who's you know, is is sent from God. So the 12 apostles of Jesus were trained by Jesus and then they were sent out by Jesus into the world. So they're apostles of Jesus. They're sent out ones. And the reason that the writer of Hebrews is calling Jesus our apostle here is he wants to say, look, we know that the Father planned our salvation from eternity past and it was the Son who obeyed the Father, became a man and carried out the Father's plan to you know, pay for our own salvation. So Jesus is called an apostle in the sense of that he was sent out from the Father. So that's the idea behind it. So we, we get a sense that Jesus has been given a charge from the Father, carry out this assignment, and that's what he does. So how large is the figure of Jesus? Well, the writer says you've got to pay more attention to him. Let the image of Jesus and what he has done become the center of your focus. Don't ever lose track of this. Again, I give you the example of the, you know, the guy that's speaking at a rally. You know, he's talking about you know, environmental faithfulness and making sure we don't you know, deal with all of our plastic refuse the way that we have. We need changes in government. He's saying, I know you already believe this, but you gotta focus on this and you gotta keep focusing on this. And that's what's being said here about Jesus. Listen Listen, Christian people, focus on Jesus. Recognize how faithful he was in doing the Father's work. Now, the rest of what we're about to read is going to be divided into two sections. The first is we're going to look at the similarity between Jesus and Moses, and then we're going to look at a contrast between Jesus and Moses. So Jesus and Moses are similar in some ways, but then the writer is going to say, however, they're dissimilar because Jesus is so vastly superior to Moses. Now, those of us who read this today, I mean, we might look at this and say, okay, I agree. I mean, Jesus is greater than Moses, so but so what? Because we already believe that, and so we're going to have to deal with the so what argument. I know that when this letter was originally written, contrasting Jesus and Moses was very important. Believers had to understand how much superior Jesus was to Moses. But if you look at it from our perspective today, living in the year in which we live, I mean, almost no one argues that Moses was superior to Jesus. Yes, Orthodox Jews would, uh, but outside of that, that's a small group of people. Everyone else agrees that Jesus is supreme over Moses. I mean, it's hardly even an argument. Why take the time here? But let me explain to you why. Imagine, first of all, that Moses is the great lawgiver. He is the one who formed the nation. He is the one who brought a consensus there, and he brought the law as well. Now, think of it in terms of law giving. There are a number of people in numerous nations around the world whose great focus on life is their national life and the fact that laws need to be protected, or maybe their focus is that certain laws need to be changed but their entire focus is always on their nation, the greatness of their nation. You need to do everything that you can to support your nation, and you need to even use your religion to bolster your nation. The nation becomes the focus, and everything else is penultimate. You know what I mean? It's it's less than the ultimate thing, which is the national life of any group of people. And so arguments against opponents are brought forward. Um, How to do social justice within the context of this nation that's taught in schools. Bad ideologies are challenged. I mean, everything is about politics. Everything is about governance. And when we talk about Jesus, he only is brought in to show how great our nation actually is. Now, please understand, I'm not denigrating any nation. I'm simply making the case that no matter what we think about anything, we need to see Jesus in terms of supremacy over everything. Your Jesus doesn't serve the nation. No, no, Jesus is supreme over the nation. 
if you contrast Jesus to whatever value system there is in our culture, then please understand this. If Jesus isn't put way above our culture, you know, he's way above our politics, he's way above our favorite issue. If Jesus doesn't get given supremacy, then we don't have a hero status of Jesus. We have a hero status of our nation or something like that. So that's the point I'm trying to make. There is a so what argument to be made here. When we read about Jesus and Moses, understand that for the Jewish mind, it had to do with the nation of Israel and its supremacy over all things. And therefore Moses is the founder of the nation. And therefore Moses is supreme. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, he's not. Jesus is. So with that as a background, let's get into this text. Now, I started by saying that the first thing that happens in our text is we're going to look at looking at the similarities between Moses and Jesus. And here, let's reread verse 2. Who, and this is referring to Jesus, Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him, that is God the Father, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. So what's that saying? Well, it's saying that at the very least, both Jesus and Moses are noted for their faithfulness. They did what the Father called them to do. Now, in reference to Moses, you know, the the passage that we have, it's actually a reference to Numbers chapter 12, where it says, Moses was faithful in all God's house. So let me tell you a little bit about Numbers chapter 12. Uh, there's a there's a there's a problem in Numbers chapter 12. There's there's <laughs> people are ready to overthrow Moses as a leader, and it's not just people. It's happening in Moses' own family. His sister Miriam and his brother Aaron are leading a charge against him, and they're saying something like this. They began to speak to uh, against Moses, and they said, "Has God only spoken to Moses? He speaks to the rest of us as well. Who does Moses think he is as being the lawgiver when everyone else?" has an opinion as well. He must, we need to take him down a few notches. And then in response to that, God speaks. And here I'm reading Numbers 12, verses 6 to 8. And he, that is the Lord, said, hear my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He's faithful in all my house. See, there's the quote. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? See, here's the point. Moses is doing what I called him to do. When you oppose Moses, you're opposing God because all that Moses is doing, he's not developing his own laws or his own ideas. He's faithful in what God has called him to do. Now, that's a mark of a hero faithful in the Christian church, faithful to what God has called him to do. Now, here's what I view. um, Any pastor who's faithful to scripture is understanding that when he stands in the pulpit, he's not called upon to give his ideas. He's called upon to expertly showcase what the Bible actually says. I remember as a pastor, every once in a while, someone would come to me and say, why don't you speak more on, I don't know, you name it, the end times, or more on, you know, the Holy Spirit, or, you know, you name it. There are a number of topics that, why don't you speak more on that? And my response was always the same. I am following the Bible through line by line, you know, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. I'm just following it through. Your argument is not with me. I mean, I'm speaking about end times, the Holy Spirit, or whatever else, as often as I find those topics in the text. I mean, your argument is with God. I'm simply faithfully discharging my duty. And see, that's the mark, I would argue, of anybody who's faithful to the Lord. They're doing what God has called them to do. And that was what Moses was, a faithful servant who faithfully discharged his duty. Now, was he perfect? No, he was not, but he was faithful. And by the way, that tells us a lot about how Christians today think about, you know, the Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament is, in fact, a revelation that has come to us from faithful prophets of God who spoke on behalf of God, not on behalf of themselves. That's why the Old Testament is still relevant to us today. So it's quite something. It's an amazing thing to say that Moses was faithful in all God's house. That is, in the end of the day, when his life is finally done 
and he's buried. And you know, they go on with leadership and they look back at all the scripture that Moses left them. In the end of the day, you look at Moses' track record and this is the word that comes to mind. Faithful, faithful, discharged his duty. He laid down his head in the end of the day, having completed the work that God had given him to do. I mean, there is nothing greater that can be said about any man or woman that they did that. Now, now, once we've said that, something is very important. And notice when we read John 6, verse 38, here's what Jesus said about his own life. He says, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, he, write, or he says, but the will of him who sent me. Just like Moses, Jesus was given a charge from the Father, and that's what faithfulness looked like for Jesus, not to do his own will, but to do the will of God who sent him, so that when Jesus was being criticized, you were not so much criticizing him, but you are criticizing the Father who had sent him, and you are proving yourself to be a rebel against the purposes of God. So if the writer of Hebrews had ended the point here, uh, I think we would have all looked at one another and said, huh, something's missing here. And, and here's what's missing. I mean, it's not enough to simply say Moses was faithful, Jesus was faithful. It's not enough. I mean, I, 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 I liken it to the following. Uh, let's say I were to say, you know, my house is an example of architecture. The Taj Mahal is an example of architecture and just left it there. And if I said it that way, you'd say, oh yeah, well that's true, that's completely true, but you know, there's a vast difference, I suspect, between your house and the Taj Mahal, and you'd be right on that. You see, the Taj Mahal is infinitely greater than my house. And so even though, you know, Moses and Jesus are both faithful, Ah, but you know what? There's so much more that needs to be said. And so in verses three to six, we have a contrast. I and mean, we talked about the similarity between Jesus and Moses. Now there's a contrast. And let me start by reading verse three again. It says, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Years ago, I was taken on a tour, and one of the people in my tour was a, is a friend of mine, and he is a very gifted architect. And we were going through Los Angeles together, and uh, we were on a Frank Lloyd Wright tour. Now, if that name doesn't ring a bell with you, don't worry about it. But for anyone who is an architect, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, I mean, his mark on American architecture is felt everywhere a house that was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright himself and built by him, that house, just having the name Frank Lloyd Wright on that house significantly, significantly increases the value of that house. So it turns out that the house itself has value, but the one who designed that house, that name has so much greater value than the house itself. And that's really what's being expressed here. So in the case of Moses, it simply said he's faithful in God's house. Now, that doesn't diminish Moses' important status. It doesn't diminish his faithfulness. It means Moses should still be our hero because his faithfulness speaks to us. Moses' track record, his greatness is not in question here because he is a faithful servant, but Jesus is not a servant in the house of God. Let me say it again. Jesus is not a servant in the house of God. Jesus is the builder of the house of God, the designer of the house of God. And uh, so Jesus has no equals. Now, I'm gonna stop here because we're gonna ask ourselves, so what does the house of God actually refer to here? Uh, what are we actually talking about? So let's get rid of the analogies. Um, what is the house of God? And my response is the house of God is the people of God, the church. Now, why is that so important? So let me compare Moses who worked in you know, the house of God, ancient Israel as compared to the church. Now Israel was a physical nation it had a biological heritage. They were all the children of Abraham. Israel received the law and the covenants. They were a great nation, but 
they were also an unfaithful nation. I mean, that's the record of the Old Testament, so much unfaithfulness. I mean, let me give you an example. During the time of Elijah the prophet, the great prophet of Israel, I mean, at one point in time, he says, oh Lord, you know, they stoned your prophets, they've killed your prophets. And they're all started worshiping idols, Baal and Asherah. And so there's no one left in this whole nation but myself. And then God responds to him and says to him, and now you need to understand that I've actually reserved 7,000 like yourself who've never bowed the knee to Baal. In other words, there's a lot more people that are faithful in Israel than you had imagined, Elijah. Now that's an important thing, yet you say 7,000 in a whole nation, that doesn't sound like a lot. Yeah, that's true. In fact, the minority in Israel were always the faithful one. It was the, the faithful minority. Uh, so much so that Isaiah the prophet said, only a remnant will be saved. And Ezekiel the prophet called Israel that rebellious house. Notice the word house. The nation is called the house, and to the most part, they are rebellious. But Jesus is the builder of a different house. He's the builder of a house of those who have been redeemed by his own blood. This is a house of those who are genuinely saved from their sins and given a new nature. And for the sake of Christ, this is the house of those people who have renounced the world and the devil for the sake of Jesus and long to follow him in faithfulness. This is the house that Jesus has built. Now, it's interesting because in the Old Testament, you have inklings of that. I mean, yes, you have the faithful remnant, but you not only have a faithful remnant, but you also have faithful people from other nations. Well, you know that's true because, for instance, in the time of Joshua, there was a, a, a woman who had been a prostitute who became faithful to the God of Israel. Her name was Rahab. We also know a Moabitess woman by the name of Ruth. We remember Naaman, the Syrian commander. All of these were Gentiles who became faithful to the God of Israel. But Jesus has built a house made up of every nation, every race, every, trung, uh, every tongue, I should say, and every tribe. He has built a house of faithfulness from all the people and groups of the earth, and nothing that Moses was involved in was ever that great. And the thing that Moses was involved in, he was simply a servant in the house, but Jesus has built a greater house than the one that Moses served in. That's how much greater Jesus is. Now we go to verse four. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now that's simply an explanatory verse. In other words, God is the Father, planned our salvation, and Jesus carried it out. Now we come to verses five and six, and this is the ultimate point of explanation. Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. Notice the word servant. And uh, to testify to the things that would be spoken of later, but Christ is faithful over God's house, not in God's house, but over it, as a son. Now notice the difference between a servant and a son. Now you can imagine, for instance, using the analogy of a house, imagine the household of a very you know, rich, wealthy aristocrat who has power, and in that house, they would have numerous servants who would make sure that things were kept in order. Some servants would be more faithful than others, and the idea is that Moses is among the most faithful that you could find, but regardless of how faithful a servant that you would find, every single owner of a large estate like that would always know the difference between a servant and a son. The difference would be the servant served, but the son was the heir of everything that was there. I mean, that's the first point that's being made here. Don't miss that. But then also, notice also that Moses served in the house. Jesus is over the house. And there is something predictive of what Moses did. Yeah. Did Moses know everything that he was doing? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, for instance, Moses was instructed to build a tabernacle as the place of worship, and he did that faithfully. Well, what was the tabernacle? Well, the tabernacle was the place where God's glory dwelt among his people. But when you read it in the Gospel of John, we find out, John writes, that Jesus, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, so that 
The tabernacle in the Old Testament was merely a fading representation of the ultimate tabernacle that would come among the human race, clothed in human flesh. That is, the glory of God would ultimately be seen in the person of Jesus. So what Moses did by building the tabernacle predicted something greater that would occur later on. The same is true of the entire sacrificial system that you know that Moses set up. This is how God is to be approached. This is how to be worshiped. And yet that was only a faint um, foretelling of a greater sacrifice that would occur on a Roman cross in Jerusalem when the ultimate son of God paid the ultimate price and sacrificed himself so that all the sins of those who looked to him would be ultimately forgiven. See, Moses did something in the house that was faithful, but it was only completed by Jesus who brought about the greater reality. That's the idea. So Israel in the Old Testament is but the beginning of something that is predictive of a greater people of God that would follow, and that was the church. And that leads us to verse 6 and we are his house. That is, we are the house that Christ has built. You follow Jesus, understand this, that the greatest work that was ever done was in the building of a church. No, no, it was not in the building of Israel. And it was not in the building of whatever nation you happen to live in. The greatest thing is not your nation. The greatest thing is not what the UN has done. The greatest thing is not the great political movements of the day. Listen, the greatest thing that was ever done in history is that God called upon his only son to build a people of every tribe, race, nation, and tongue on earth who would be the eternal people of God. That's where all of history is going. And the one who did that is the greatest hero that we ever have, the one who paid for it by the sacrifice of his own life. Was he a superstar in his day? No, no, he was mocked and ridiculed and became a man of sorrows. But the vision that he had from the Father is the one that he fulfilled. That's why if you have somebody in your mind who is the greatest of all people, always fix your eyes on Jesus. He is the hero of the Christian faith. There is no greater name that can be spoken than his name for what he has done and what he has accomplished has no equals in all of history. That's why we worship Jesus. Hey, thank you for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada today. Um, Thank you for taking the time and investing yourself in knowing the scripture and out of the scripture to making Jesus the object of your highest worship. God bless you. May the Lord be with you today. Have a good day. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, Thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.